Hello everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Anfal al uh, I'm a family medicine specialist at MediClinic City Hospital. And today uh, I'll be giving a small talk about asthma, hopefully uh, allowing you to understand a little bit about the disease and maybe answer some of your queries. So uh, thank you for having me and thanks for everyone who has joined in. So let's begin. So, breathing easy. The things that I'll be touching about uh, and talking about in this presentation, I'll try to keep it pretty simple so that everybody uh, could understand it. Hopefully, I won't bore you. So, we'll talk a little bit about uh, asthma, what it is, the causes, triggers, um, some of the common symptoms, of course, how to diagnose it, how to identify and classify it in terms of severity, which, of course, is the most important part and will determine our management. And then some of the lifestyle changes that we can do to help lessen our chances of getting asthma attacks. So, uh, as you may know, Asthma or bronchial asthma is actually one of the most common respiratory conditions and it affects millions of people worldwide. So the last statistics that we could get from 2019 actually showed that there are 262 million people affected by the disease and it had caused around 450,000 deaths due to it or its complications. So it's not something to be taken lightly, but thankfully with proper management and um, early follow-ups, we are able to achieve uh, normal or near normal um, active lifestyles for most of the patients. So to put it in a simple way, so uh, it is a chronic respiratory condition, chronic meaning that it's something that's lifelong, and it is characterized by a few things that uh, all go into play that causes a disease. So we have inflammation, narrowing, and swelling of the airways. Now, the thing about asthma is that it can be more likely in people who have other allergies as well. So if you have a family member or yourself are having uh, eczema or allergic rhinitis or hay fever, then chances are they may develop asthma as well. And if another family member has eczema, this also increases the chances of other family members uh, to have asthma. So they're all interrelated basically. Of course, they can range from mild to severe, and there are different triggers, including allergens, exercise, and stress, and we'll come to that. Now, the underlying mechanism is a combination of things, as we said. So once a harmless substance, but for the asthmatic patient, it is an allergen, it comes into contact with the airways, then this triggers an inflammation in the airway system or the windpipes. So there has swelling of the mucosa or the thin lining of the airways. So um, the inflammation continues, uh, the swelling leads to narrowing, the narrowing leads to the sensation of obstruction or inability to breathe in properly. And then this causes hyper responsiveness, which increases in turn the inflammation, and then the cycle continues. Luckily, it is reversible because there are some other lung diseases that have similar mechanisms, but unfortunately they tend to not completely resolve. In terms of the cause, there is no specific direct cause that has been identified as to exactly the reason behind asthma. But as we know, there are many risk factors and many triggers for asthma. So uh, it can happen at any age in different ethnicities and uh, both genders, of course. Uh, genetics plays a strong factor. So if there are family history of asthma, then this increases the risk. Um, urbanization plays a role as well. So there have been some studies that notice that there are increase in asthma rates in the cities as compared to in the countryside or suburban areas. Now this can be due to different things. It can be because of the pollution and the air irritants. It can also be because of the um, exposure to nature and the different bacteria and organisms and all that that are present in nature and that children in the suburbs are more likely to be exposed to than people in the city. Of course, there's occupational asthma that can happen due to um, occupational exposure or exposure from the workplace. This can be from chemicals, fumes, dust, or different uh, irritants that uh, some uh, people have to deal with on a daily basis in their workplace. Um, some events early in life have been linked to asthma as well. So they have noticed increased risk of developing asthma in patients that have been born as a low birth weight baby or those that have been born prematurely before nine months of uh, before completing the full nine months in their pregnancy. Also, there is obesity. 
this has been uh, strongly linked with asthma and it affects all ages. So obesity has been linked with asthma in children, adolescents and adults. Now, uh, as to the common triggers, of course, there are many and they differ from people for, for different people, but um, by far pollen is the most common. Then we've got the dust mites, pet dander or animal fur. We've got the mold. Viral infection can trigger asthma for a lot of people. Strong perfumes, and it's not necessarily the perfumes that we apply. It can also be the diffusers, the air fresheners, and the different smells that are like in aromatherapy or incense burning, like mahur and other things. And then you've got, of course, smoke, be it from uh, cars, uh, smoking cigarettes, or the um, uh, incense burning. There are also other things such as certain foods, and this differs for different people. So it can be from eggs, seafood, um, shellfish, uh, cow's milk for some people as well, in addition to exercise and uh, stress. So these are some of the common triggers for asthma. Now, um, with regards to dust mites, um, some people may notice, depending on the environment that they live in, for example, be it their home or their workplace, wherever they spend long time and long hours in, uh, they can notice sometimes that their asthma worsens. So uh, certain furniture and items that are available around us that we may not pay attention to can actually worsen asthma. So for example, having the normal traditional thick carpets, uh, having the traditional fabric curtains, these can uh, accumulate dust and they can worsen asthma symptoms even if they are regularly clean. Some people use strong detergents. These also can, um, chemical ones, trigger asthma as well. So uh, now coming to the symptoms, of course, as everyone knows, the most common symptoms, you've got the wheezing, the cough, shortness of breath and chest tightness. The cough has been noticed to be uh, persistent in asthma as compared to some other uh, illnesses. Of course, it overlaps with many. Uh, it's also worse at night. Uh, the wheezing, which is like a whistling sensation uh, and a whistling sound that can be heard sometimes if it is soft, it's only heard by the patient himself or herself. And sometimes it can actually be loud enough to be heard by somebody else sitting in front of them. So normally it can happen while exhaling and can happen with inhaling as well. Shortness of breath or difficulty breathing in asthma symptoms, it can happen even at rest. So not necessarily that the patient has done certain strenuous physical activity. Chest tightness or difficulty breathing. Uh, this can also be the first sign that there's a flare up. It can worsen with exercise for people prone with asthma. It can give a sensation as if they're trying to breathe into a steel windpipe. Coming to the diagnosis, so if we are suspecting asthma and, and we'd like to make sure, there are a few things that we need to do. So before labeling someone with a, with a lifelong illness, regardless of how severe it is, it's always important that we know this is the right diagnosis. So we need to ask a lot of questions about the patient himself and the family. So we need to ask about the symptoms. When did they start? Uh, how did they get better? How did they get worse? Do they notice them in specific environments? Have they tried any medicine with any effect or not? And have they noticed any triggers that worsen these symptoms? And again, of course, the family history about it and the list goes on. Now, physical examination is also important and having a normal examination doesn't necessarily mean the person doesn't have asthma. So uh, we need to listen to the chest, of course, but we need to also look for other signs that this patient has allergic tendencies. Some signs could be skin rashes. Um, we need to look at the nose to see if there are any signs of uh, long term inflammation and congestion. It can also mean they may have hay fever and it can mean other stuff as well. So we always need to differentiate. And there are some signs that could be seen in the eyes as well. And just by examining the conjunctiva or the red part underneath the eye, it can tell us, especially if somebody is prone to having repeated allergies. Now, the last bit or the diagnostic test, it's actually recommended, especially if you're planning to go on long-term treatment. So we have to be sure that we're dealing with asthma and not something else. Uh, it's best done by a pulmonary specialist. So we have two types. Um, I'll try to just explain them briefly. So we have the spirometry, which is basically a type of lung function test. The patient goes into a chamber and then they get a, a, a little piece gets put on the nose, as you can see here in the photo on the right. And then they breathe into a device and it records their readings into a graph similar to this one, but it's not this one, it's a different one. So 
they ask them to breathe at different intervals and they repeat it a few times and then they're able to get the readings and these readings are used to interpret and see the lung function whether it is normal or whether it goes with different kinds of diseases we namely describe them as obstructive disease which asthma is one of them or a restrictive disease so it all depends on the physician interpretation as well the other bit which is the peak expiratory flow it's this device you see in the middle. This is a very simple one. It can be found in the office. Some patients even have them at home, especially if they're already known asthmatics. So this plastic mouthpiece is the, um, the white bit that you see at the end of the blue. So patients are asked to stay upright. They um, take a deep breath in and out. And then once they're ready, they take a deep breath in and exhale as strong as possible and as fast as possible into this piece. So this is done three times. And then according to the highest reading, this is the best peak exposure flow for that patient. And then we, of course, compare it with this graph and we take a lot of factors into consideration, including the gender, the age and the height. And this will determine what is normal. And if we're trying to diagnose asthma and the patient is having symptoms, we then give them a trial of the asthma inhalers and then we reassess in 15 minutes, again using the same test. And if we noticed at least a 20% improvement in the best peak flow, this means that this is diagnosis of asthma as well. So it can help to lean us toward this diagnosis because the patient responded to the asthma management very well. Now, once we've established the diagnosis of asthma, the next step is to determine its severity. So in order to decide what's the best treatment to be given, we need to know how severe is this asthma. And of course, this is not just a judgment that the physician makes by themselves, but we have to follow guidelines on that as well. So asthma categories are basically either intermittent or persistent. Intermittent being that the patient is completely free of symptoms in between attacks and they have no limitation in activity. They have no um, nighttime symptoms or very few. I'll come to that now. And uh, they don't need any inhalers in between. So uh, persistent, however, has three grades, mild, moderate and severe. How do we decide where the patient falls? We follow a table similar to this one. So as you can see in the top row there, we have the classification of severity, intermittent versus the persistent grades. And then on the left column, you can see the components that we use uh, to identify the severity. So we need to check the daytime symptoms, nighttime symptoms, the response to the inhalers, uh, interference with their uh, activity, and the lung function, the lung function being the spirometry tests if done. Now, we usually mark the categories based on the patient's responses, and then the diagnosis is made based on the most severe category in which any of the components occur. So if the patient has all the symptoms within the intermittent, but has one reading or one symptom that falls within the persistent, then he is considered persistent and treated accordingly. Of course, this is very important because uh, this will determine the management, which in turn will, will impact the quality of life of the patient and uh, their risks of future uh, asthma attacks and complications. Once we have determined the uh, asthma severity, we come to the management of asthma. So we have to tackle actually different um, components in managing asthma. First and foremost, of course, will be the symptoms and the triggers. So it's useful to track the symptoms and identify any triggers that each patient is experiencing personally. That can be done using a diary or an app, at least records them for the first few weeks, and then try to develop strategies to overcome and avoid these triggers, whether it being using a humidifier at home, uh, having an air filter, keeping windows closed, changing curtains and carpets, uh, changing detergents, changing perfumes, or some uh, skincare products, it uh, depends on what could be triggering the patient. Then of course we come to the medications, one of which is the newly introduced smart therapy, which I'll talk about in a minute. And of course, most important is the proper inhaler technique. So you've got different devices, they uh, work differently, and it's very important that the patient is confident in using it in the proper way. So it's always a good idea to try it with your doctor, and, and demonstrate in front of them and also double check with the pharmacist and look at any videos if uh, supplemented regarding the use of certain devices to make sure that you're using them correctly because there is a difference between having persistent asthma and having difficult to treat asthma because of improper technique or uh, not um, adhering to the 
treatment plan that your doctor would recommend for you. Of course, everything has to be in a shared decision between the patient and the doctor and by following the guidelines. There's also something we call an asthma action plan. Probably not many of you have used that, but it's also one of the helpful tools and it can be helpful for parents as well, especially for children that are having asthma. And then we've got the regular follow ups. So once we've dealt with the triggers, uh, we need to know what are the, our goals. So a few things that we not, we'd like to look at and try to achieve when we're dealing with um, asthmatic patients. Uh, basically, we would like to achieve and maintain control of the symptoms, uh, normal activity levels, even exercise can go back to normal with proper use of the medications, depending on their severity. We need to maintain as close as to normal as possible lung function results, uh, try to prevent asthma attacks as much as possible, um, avoid the side effects and minimize them as much as possible and prevent asthma related deaths. So these are our main goals. Now. There are very various medications available in the market. Each one of these categories that I've listed also has multiple medications underneath it, so I won't bore you with these, but I'll just give you a little bit of tips on how they are being used. So uh, one of the most common and important medications are the inhaled corticosteroids, and then we've got the bronchodilators, including the short-acting bronchodilator, which probably you may know as salbutamol or albuterol or ventolin. And then you've got the long-acting bronchodilators. These are normally used as uh, preventers, so they have long-term slow action. And then you've got the ligature modifier. You probably may know as Montelacast or Singulet. And then, of course, you've got the anticholinergics, the steroids, and the immunotherapy or biologic agents. Now, how do we decide what to give? Again, we have to rely on guidelines. So generally, Medicines are divided into two categories, so we've got the quick relievers and then we've got the long-term control. Now, a recent change in the asthma guidelines um, has just been introduced over the past two to three years based on uh, what we call randomized control trials. So these are like the highest evidence in medicine when we rely on uh, data from uh, research in order to change a certain method. So as you may probably know, like Ventolin or Selbitamol uh, inhalers, they have been the first choice for over 50 years. So this is a major change that has happened right now. It hasn't been adopted worldwide yet. So if you're interested in something like that, you have to speak with your doctor as well and see if it fits or not. So the change has been instead of using um, the short acting beta agonists or SABA, which is the salbutamol inhaler. They are now uh, introducing using a combination of the ICS and formiterol. ICS being the inhaled corticosteroid and formiterol is one type of long acting bronchodilators. The reason they specified formiterol and they didn't just say long acting bronchodilator is because in the studies they have noticed that formiterol was always superior and the same results were not achieved when using different long acting beta agonists. Now in terms of the inhaled corticosteroids, most of the studies have been on bedicinide. So the combination of choice that they've talked about now is the bedicinide formiterol. There are other medications that are currently underway and awaiting their studies to be published in order to decide if they meet the um, evidence for the efficacy and safety. So first step, as you can see here, so we've got two rows, one here, and this is the alternative one for people who are still not comfortable using the new medicine. So the first one would be to use the um, combination medicine. In our case, it is the bedicinide formiterol or Symbicort. It can be used as a reliever instead of using the Ventolin. They have noticed in the studies that when they use the new medicine, the uh, timing between acute episodes or acute attacks has increased, so they don't occur as frequently. And they've noticed um, significant improvement, just similar to that when they are using the short acting beta agonist, except that with the corticosteroids, you're actually reducing the inflammation that is happening in the airways. You're improving the symptoms in addition to uh, having added benefit of reducing the episodes of inflammation and exacerbation that the patient may encounter. Now, in case the patient is in not responding to these as needed doses, then they go on to the daily dose. So it's just the same medicine, but they have to take it at a regular interval on a daily basis. 
And then if that is not working, they increase the dose as well of that same medicine and then add-ons can occur depending on the needs. Of course, in each step of the way, just before we, we do any changes, it's very important to assess the patient. So we have to assess the inhaler technique, if the patient is using it as required or not, if the patient is having any new symptoms, any modifiable symptoms that can be changed or risk factors, sorry, that can be changed. Um, example, uh, changes in, in the environment that they're in or the um, exposure to allergies or allergens around them. And it's also a good idea to confirm the diagnosis if it hasn't been confirmed before. Uh, adjust the treatment accordingly together with your physician and then again review how well you're doing on the new treatment. So normally we would give at least a two to four week period before deciding that this treatment is working or not. Of course, all while checking all the other things that we talked about. Now, as you may notice here, this chart is for 12 years and above, but there are similar ones with minor changes for those that are younger. So zero to four and six to 11. The SMART therapy that we talked about, it's basically a uh, abbreviation for single maintenance and reliever therapy. So uh, the one, as I mentioned, uh, we have a Symbicort, which is budesonide and formiterol. This has an inhaled corticosteroid and uh, um, the reliever or the long acting uh, beta agonist. So in this case, it gives us the function of both relieving the symptoms and maintaining them. Uh, the typical dose for that would be uh, two puffs, whether they're taken one in the evening, one in the morning, or whether it's two puffs at the same time, once a day only. Now the technique is very important. This type of device is called a turbo haler. The way you use it is you have to unscrew it, remove the cover, and then you have to click it in one, twist in one direction until you get a click, and then twist back in the opposite direction, which will release the medicine. Then the most important step will be the inhalation part. So make sure your mouth is sealed properly around the mouthpiece. Once you're ready, you inhale as deep as possible and then remove the mouthpiece, close the mouth, and try to hold your breath for at least 10 seconds or as long as possible, and replace the cover. Of course, one of the side effects uh, with using uh, corticosteroids as an inhaler is it's important to, to gargle after that because some of the residue of the steroids can deposit and remain in the mouth. And if the person was not um, inhaling in a proper technique or they did not wash their mouth after, it can predispose them to candida infections or fungal infections. Uh, coming to the action plan. so. Usually it's it's a paper that looks uh, similar to this one. Of course, now there are apps for everything as well. So uh, it gives you a green zone, a yellow zone, and a red zone. Usually it is um, shared with your doctor. So you write in all the information with regards to what medicine you should take if you're doing well, how much to take, and when to take them. And then if the person has a peak flow meter at home as well, so they can record these readings, it will help guide them in terms of their management as to when they are getting worse into the yellow zone or the red zone. Uh, this is also helpful for those who are a bit in um, uncontrolled situation. So it's helpful to keep with family members, uh, close colleagues, friends, so that they can help you in case of sudden deterioration. to uh, last but not least the lifestyle modifications of course um, as we mentioned so tackling the risk factors is very important trying to maintain a healthy weight quitting smoking some breathing exercises it can help like the purse slip breathing um, eating diet that is rich in antioxidants and omega-3 that are found uh, as anti-inflammatory properties they can help also with asthma uh, taking your vaccinations, especially for those uh, with severe asthma or uncontrolled asthma, as it can help prevent uh, future attacks if they do, God forbid, get the infections. This includes their annual flu vaccine, the COVID vaccine, and uh, what we call the pneumococcal vaccine, which is responsible for the preventing the pneumonias. And then, of course, managing stress is very important, as emotional stress has been known to cause and be a common trigger for asthma in a lot of people. So takeaway from this presentation is just uh, prevention is key. So daily habits are very important and they can shape uh, whether even if you're having the risk factors for asthma, it can tell whether you can 
develop asthma eventually or not. So having a healthy lifestyle, avoiding triggers and chemicals in general, having good hand hygiene, and then regular follow-ups with your physicians to make sure everything is in check and to target any symptoms um, as soon as they arise. These were my references. And thank you for listening. Any questions? Yeah, sure. There are a good number of questions, Doc. I'll read out for you to answer. Sure. Uh, so, Doc, during your uh, session, you said uh, you said something about interrelated with family members. Does it uh, does it uh, state hereditary or it it is living together in the same home with asthma? What what is the relevance of that? Okay, so asthma is not contagious. So it's not something that you can pick up just by sitting with somebody who has asthma. It doesn't work this way, but it has hereditary components. Yes, that is correct, but they haven't been able to identify what exactly. But what we know for sure is that it does run in families. So if you have parents, aunts, siblings, cousins that are having asthma and and the stronger the disease and, and the more severe the uh, the disease it is in the family, the more likely that that person can get the disease. That doesn't mean that they will. It all depends on the lifestyle, of course. As we mentioned, environmental factors are very important. So if that patient or that person is taking care of themselves, eating healthy, uh, exercising regularly, um, avoiding smoking, um, able to manage their stress in a reasonable manner, then it is unlikely that they will end up with asthma. Hope this answers it. So, Doc, going to the next question, which is related to smoking, specifically vaping, because uh, a lot of people who used to smoke cigarettes now have moved to vaping and e-cigarettes, thinking it's cheaper. Uh, I mean, uh, safer. What do you? What is your thought about it? And uh, does vaping have long effects? What do you think of, from a lung cancer or other complication perspective? So, as a doctor. I can tell you that um, e-cigarettes, vaping, shisha, all forms of smoking, they all have the same risks, unfortunately. Now, regardless of the components that are in them, they all have been shown to be linked with um, increased uh, infections, lung infections. They're predisposing to lung cancers and uh, they all can affect you in one way or another. Now, who can get affected when? This all depends on genetics as well. So you can find people that can smoke for years and they don't get anything. And then you can find others that have only been smoking for five to 10 years and they end up with a lot of complications. So uh, they all fall under the same category. They are not safe, they're not recommended. And um, the, the best way would be to quit if possible. Doc, do you recommend any specific type of a diet for an asthma patient, you know, or any kind of a specific supplements for asthma? OK, so there have been many studies about that, actually, and trying to identify if they follow a certain diet or if they take certain medicines or or herbal supplements. There hasn't been anything conclusive. But it doesn't hurt as long as it is um, simple options and healthy changes. So, for example, uh, as we mentioned, asthma patients have tendency for allergies and they have tendency to uh, have their immune system respond to a normal harmless substance as an allergy trigger. So things that are known to have higher allergy uh, tendencies would be a good idea to avoid, but it depends from person to person. For example, some uh, people can be um, triggered by eggs, by cow's milk and its proteins, um, by some nuts, including peanuts, and uh, by uh, fish. But on the other hand, if that person doesn't have these allergies and doesn't have any problems with these, they're actually very beneficial. So um, eggs has proteins which are very important. Cow's milk as well is very important. You've got um, the fish has the omega-3 and the fatty acids that are very important. Um, the nuts as well, they have uh, very important antioxidants that are all considered um, sort of, um, I wouldn't say medicine, 
but they're substances that help to reduce inflammation in the body in general, be it uh, in the airways or in the rest of the body. So it is recommended. So we've got um, mixed berries, leafy greens, increasing fruits and vegetables in general is helpful. Of course, within limits, uh, you also have to look at other uh, complications and other diseases. So for example, if that person is an elderly or someone who has diabetes or high, high blood pressure, so I wouldn't recommend everything at the same time. So for example, uh, some fruits can be very sweet, which in turn can raise the sugar. So it's all in moderation. And if you do think you have any changes that you could make or you have room to improve, please do talk to your doctor about it. So does a long term flu symptoms, uh, you know, or upper respiratory symptoms, are the symptoms of asthma or it can lead to asthma? Uh, yes, unfortunately, and some people, their first attack of asthma actually happens after viral infections, so there has been links with that. But then again, it depends on um, the treatment that they have taken. So some viral infections tend to run a long course. So in order to decide exactly if this is still a viral infection or if they are going into an allergic uh, response and it's going into a, a variant of asthma, uh, you need to, of course, take your medications as prescribed by your doctor and then follow up accordingly to decide. But um, viral infections have been known to be one of the triggers for asthma. Hope this answers it as well. Yeah. Uh, Doc, ask, are there any specific uh, medical tests which someone should undergo before being uh, established diagnosis of asthma? Yes, so as I mentioned, uh, two of the tests that we prefer to be done, especially if that person would need a daily or long term management is the spirometry test or the lung function test. So if you visit a lung doctor or a pulmonary doctor, you can ask them about that. Uh, most of them have it in their offices and it can be done. And then the peak expiratory flow meter, which is the device that I showed, is just a small handheld device. Uh, some patients have it, some can buy it. You can also, uh, if it's available at some doctor's offices, you can do the test there and decide. Uh, there are also some blood tests to be done, but that again, that would be a second and a third step, depending on how well uh, the diagnosis is. Or is it confirmed, not confirmed? Do they have any doubts, the response to treatment? Have they tried anything or not? And then how well these things are working for them? That's true. Uh, so, Doc, do you have any similar table to the one for classifying asthma for young children, three years old? So specifically, the member wants to know about a three year old child. Is there any classification? Yeah, so for children between zero and four years of age, um, doctors are generally a bit reluctant to label them as asthmatic. However, a lot of cases do actually come with wheezing and they have typical symptoms. Now, it depends on how the, the, the patient or the child is at the time of presentation. Uh, of course, as I told you, it cannot be just done um, very quickly. We have to be careful with the history. We have to know um, about the family as well. So if they have any older siblings, family members that have been diagnosed with asthma, if we have established allergies in the family, this can help lean us toward that diagnosis. But to make an official diagnosis of asthma, they generally don't do that until the child is at least five years old, because that's the minimum age where they can actually undergo a spirometry test and follow the instructions and this way you have a definitive diagnosis but um, they've also so, uh, shown in studies that it doesn't hurt to give them short courses of asthma treatment so nothing long term but just for example if they do get the symptoms after a viral infection uh, or after being exposed to certain triggers then it's helpful to just take a short course until the symptoms resolve so um, please do speak to your pediatrician about it and there are also uh, child pulmonary doctors or child lung doctors that you can also visit and, and have the child be seen and examined in order to make a proper diagnosis. Does sinus infection lead to asthma? If yes, how to prevent sinus infection without medication? What is the cause of sinus infection? Okay, so sinus infection is actually a very broad term. So the sinuses are actually like small pockets of air that are, uh, sorry, 
that are present in our faces in specific areas. So they help to, uh, they have many functions in terms of keeping our bones light, in addition to clearing the mucus, and they, dra they help drain the nose. Now, in some people, these um, openings that lead to the sinuses, they can become blocked. The secretions uh, can become thick. Uh, they have over secretions because, for example, allergies or because of an infection like a viral or a bacterial infection. In this case, the patient can develop a sinus infection. Now, it can be a viral or a bacterial. Of course, in order to decide, you have to see your physician and have to be examined to make out the diagnosis. Different sinuses can be uh, affected. So you've got the frontal sinus somewhere around the forehead, and then you've got the maxillary sinus, just out the cheekbone area. So if that's someone who has repeated sinus infections, a good idea would be to do the um, nasal wash, so this is just by using normal saline. It helps to clean the nose and this will help also to open up the sinuses a little bit for them. Taking some medications, um, you probably heard of them as anti-allergy or antihistamines. These can help in some people, but I know the, the question they preferred non-medicines. So in terms of you're trying to, to avoid medicine, in that case, you need to try as much as possible um, breathing exercises, uh, trying to eat healthy, avoid triggers, because normally if you get repeated infections, you most likely know what's causing it for you. So trying to avoid these infections can help lessen these sinus uh, infections as well, but there's nothing definitive that I can tell you without proper examination. And this blockage that we talked about the, is because of increased secretion. Increased secretion can happen in all the airways, which in turn can eventually lead to asthma if that person is predisposed to asthma. So it's not necessarily, but it can affect. So doc, there is something called exercise induced asthma, which causes Absolutely. lack of breathlessness. So sh should uh, we understand that uh, with a EIA condition, that person can never do an exercise or is there a way out? No, absolutely they can. So actually one of the management goals is for the patient to be able to do exercise without limitation. So uh, exercise induced asthma is actually managed a little bit differently. Uh, in terms of that, so of course we have to identify that the patient really doesn't have anything else and it's just this asthma. In that case, we recommend using the inhaler at least 15 minutes before doing the exercise. Now, um, usually two puffs are recommended, but then you have to um, arrange that with your physician to see if that works or not. Normal people can benefit a lot from that. It can actually help them to continue their exercise without symptoms. But if they continue to have symptoms, then we have to refer to the classification to identify exactly at what stage they are and if they need any more treatment. Some may benefit from the daily inhaled corticosteroids. So these help reduce inflammation, reduce the swelling, they help relax the smooth muscles. And in this way, uh, together with the uh, short acting inhaler that are used just before exercise, the combination can help them to do their exercises without problems, hopefully. So do, do wearing mask all times during working hours in office uh, could help to relieve the symptoms or does it affect the symptoms? So that is different from person to person and even uh, the materials that the masks are made of. So as you know now, there are various, various uh, options available. So some materials, unfortunately, um, like the, the cheaper ones, they have been found to have some irritants where patients are not comfortable with them. So they either gave them sort of a contact dermatitis or allergies on the face itself, on the skin. Some have caused them more breathing problems. Um, normally, if the patient is actively asthmatic and wearing a mask or sort of uh, covering their uh, breathing, it can a little bit worsen for them, at least temporarily. But if they are well controlled and not having any problems, then the mask shouldn't affect at all. So many studies have been done on that with different results, but the conclusion was that the mask shouldn't be a problem for asthmatic patients. So Ventolin is available over the counter. Is Symbicort, so is Symbicort and Ventolin similar? Is it also um, over-the-counter drug? I wouldn't recommend it to be taken over-the-counter, even if it was. I don't have information about that, 
but uh, since it has steroids in it, so I wouldn't recommend that you take it without a doctor's prescription and follow up. So it's very important to uh, actually plan it with your doctor and decide how much you actually need to take from it. And then they need to assess you before you take it. And then at least a month after you've started the treatment to identify if you're actually benefiting from it or not. And if you need to continue on the same dose or increase or decrease. So please do not try to take it over the counter, even if it was available. It's always um, better to visit your doctor first. Understood. Doc, so since we were talking about Ventolin, there's one more question that, you know, we once the doctor prescribes Ventolin or Palmicot, parents tend to, you know, give this medicine the moment there is a flu or because usually the nebulizer is readily available at home. But what I've heard is Ventolin has a side effect on the heartbeat, heart treats. So what do you recommend? What is your say on that? It is true, actually. All these medicines have side effects, of course, and um, the effect of them on, on people is different. So these side effects are all listed. They're well known to their doctors and they can advise you about them. But then it's not necessary that everybody would get them. Now, Ventolin is known to cause an increased heart rate or what we call palpitations. It can cause a little bit of headache as well, and it can cause some trembling or shaking in the hands. Not everyone experiences that. A lot of people use Ventolin on a daily basis and they're doing very well on it. But if, they, if your child is having that, then I would recommend that you have to check with your doctor before giving it to them. And it's always a good idea to plan ahead. So if you are the type of person who prefers to manage the child at home before going to the doctor, so once you visit them, you can always have a plan with them as to, based on your child's health and examination, whether uh, you need to give any medicine, when to start it, what's the appropriate dose. And if you do notice any side effect in your child, you have to also tell the doctor so that they can adjust accordingly. So side effects are normal, they're expected. If they are not tolerated, then the medicine can be changed into a different one. Doc, now it's a very um, uh, specific condition. So the question goes like this. My wife, 37 years and kid, five years, have always been suffering from shortness of breath, which worsen at night. Could you please share uh, any physician's name in uh, Abu Dhabi? So, the, so maybe the first part of it, doctor, you may want to pick up uh, that uh, that what are the kind of symptoms, how to manage it, particularly at night. And uh, with regards to the doctor at MediClinic Abu Dhabi, that is something you may want to, you know, advise later. Yeah. So uh, in terms of the symptoms you're describing, it seems that they may be having some sort of um, irritation that is causing this. Now, just the fact that they're having shortness of breath without any other symptoms, it would be difficult for me to, to decide that this is asthma or not, but I think they definitely, it's worth a visit to the doctor. Many patients, when they have a few symptoms that they're used to every now and then, they tend to believe that this is their normal and they have to just live with it, but in reality, it doesn't have to be this way. So it can be treated. You just need to take the time and address your health concerns with your doctor. So I would recommend maybe visiting a family doctor to start with or a general doctor and then uh, take their perspective on that. And if they do think that you need to be seen by a lung specialist, then you need to try and see a pulmonary doctor or sometimes it can be related to the heart. Sometimes it can be related to the thyroid. So there could be many reasons before we label it as asthma or anything else. But if they do have a family history, if there are some allergic tendencies, then you have to see your doctor first to decide on how bad is it and what treatments are needed. So doc, next question, can a person about 25 years of age still develop chronic asthma or is there any specific age group which asthma usually develops? Well, uh, asthma can develop at any age, unfortunately. Now, a lot of asthmatic patients um, tend to start at childhood, which is when uh, they get exposed to the irritants and uh, allergens, especially if they have a strong family history. But you can develop asthma later in life as well. It depends on the lifestyle you've been leading and the exposure that you've been having. But to decide whether this is asthma or another disease, because there are many diseases that overlap as well, it's also best to visit your doctor and have a proper evaluation. But yes, it is possible at any age, unfortunately.
So there is a comment that the doctor did not explain about allergies. So I, the uh, doctor uh, Anfal spoke about allergies, which is specific to asthma. Allergies is a very vast topic to touch base on everything. There are skin allergies, there are food allergies, there are other all other kind of allergies. So this. On this session, we focused on the respiratory allergies. So, Doc, do you want to repeat few highlights of the respiratory allergies and what can trigger an asthma? Absolutely. So, um, as as you uh, perfectly mentioned, there are many allergies. So, if we want to talk about the respiratory allergies related to asthma specifically, uh, the most common worldwide that have been shown to be pollen. But then uh, we have the dust mites as well, which are actually available everywhere around us, but we don't pay attention to them. So uh, the furniture around the house can um, have a significant impact. For example, the carpets, the curtains, the bed linens, the um, detergents, um, these chemicals all can be considered allergens. Uh, you have as well uh, perfumes, diffusers, air fresheners, um, if you have any pets at home. So I know some people um, can be asthmatic and can be uh, very uncontrolled, but they refuse to give up their pets. So um, unfortunately, asthma can worsen from pet dander and animal fur depends on uh, what the patient's allergic to. So um, you can always test with your physician as well if you're unsure, but um, these are just one of many. Uh, exercise as well can be a trigger. Stress can be a trigger for many people and certain foods can actually trigger asthma. So doc, also I would want to add doc, how about the soft toys? Because that is a gift usually we give for kids without knowing that if it is not being sanitized uh, very regularly, that is something which can trigger asthma and respiratory allergies. Yes, actually, Vina, regardless of the sanitation, depends on the toy itself. So some soft toys that have too much furs or too much fabric on them, it uh, depends on the material that has been used. They can actually trigger asthma in some children, uh, even adults. So it depends on how prone the child is. But yeah, these are one of the important ones. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. So Doc, is asthma and COPD safe? how to determine if someone has asthma or COPD. So doc, to start with, maybe we have to um, it, uh, expand what is COPD yeah. for people to understand. Yes. Yeah, so COPD is actually an abbreviation for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and asthma is one of its diseases. So asthma is one and chronic bronchitis is the other. Now COPD can happen, um, COPD uh, can happen in smokers, and it can happen in those, uh, it can be like those that are asthmatic, but the treatment is different. So when I say that patient is um, COPD, that's a very general term that we don't need really to use if we're trying to treat somebody. So you have to identify exactly what kind of disease are you treating. But asthma falls under COPD. So Doc, what is, um, what is that which will um, uh, improve the allergic condition? Does uh, exposure to sun or um, any kind of a supplement helps in allergic conditions? So it depends on the allergen itself and depends on how high the allergy is. So if you are bothered about anything in particular, it's always a good idea to mention it to your doctor and get tested for it. So there are tests that could be done skin prick test, uh, blood test, um, IgE levels. Uh, there are many different tests that can be done to determine how badly do you react to a certain thing and if you are able to actually desensitize yourself from it. So this is a, a different pathway that I would recommend if you are interested in and you probably need to visit an immunologist or an allergologist. So that's somebody who specializes in allergies that can help guide you. But generally speaking, now, there are a lot of theories, but I wouldn't say that they are 100% uh, proven. So don't take my word for it. But things that have been spoken about, they have said that if you are 
from childhood being exposed to extreme sanitation. The child did not have any illnesses. Uh, they're always playing in, in very well controlled environments, very clean, very hygienic, that they are more prone to develop allergies later in life because their body is not able to recognize these substances. So they automatically determine them in the future as harmful. But uh, if the child is able to actually be exposed to different allergens, or substances, so they are, they play outside, they play in the sand, they play in the grass. Um, they are ex they are being in in different environments, and they they get sick, unfortunately, not willingly. Uh, in that sense, it helps to uh, strengthen and improve their immunity, and it helps to sort of build a profile in their body as to what is harmful, what is harmless, what do I need to trigger an immune response to, and what is okay to just let it slide. So it can reduce the tendency to develop allergies, but these are all just theories. Um, so the things that are well known is obesity, smoking, and a healthy diet. These can definitely help improve the allergic state for patients. Doc, uh, is there any specific age when uh, you know the prognosis of these uh, asthma is good? Do you think um, children who develop asthma at a very early age, usually at while they reach up until teenage, usually it you know it it gets better? True, there is no cut of age, but yeah, many of them tend to outgrow it, so it becomes just a childhood asthma in the background. It can come back for certain people with certain triggers, so if they fall ill with a certain infection, if it's a bad chest infection, um, for some uh, girls, for example, when they grow up and become pregnant, um, they can develop flare-ups of asthma in the future. Uh, some can also develop them um, if they are exposed to um, certain allergens in high concentration, so depending if it's in the workplace, or in, in, in our, uh, sort of industrial implants and things like that. So it depends on the trigger you're exposed to. It, it can come back, but yeah, many people do outgrow it. Look, what is bacterial asthma? Is it different from the normal asthma? Is there something called bacterial asthma? I haven't come across that, to be honest. So maybe that's something that I should look up. Okay. Uh... Doc, uh, next question is related to, you know, hypersensitive runny nose where someone is having even a spi it's not spicy. The moment have food, there is a runny nose. Mm -hmm. So have you come across any of those conditions? Yeah, but that is different. So that is not necessarily allergy. That is just your body's reaction because you've eaten something very spicy. Now, if you're eating something that's causing you these symptoms, that's probably too spicy for you. So you should try to take something less. And um, one of the differentials for cough or one of our ideas, some, some people can develop cough and they notice, for example, it's worse after certain foods, especially spicy foods or fatty foods. That can be because of the heartburn that develops after that. Patients don't necessarily feel that, but it does go up and irritate the throat and triggers this cough sensation. So the doc next question is related to a bit of drama. So the question is that whenever I get exposed to sun and sweat, I get a lot of rashes that are not itchy in my legs and arms only. I have been using Dermovate cream whenever I get this. Do you think this is caused by sweat that I that that I get this kind of allergy? Uh, this is a different thing than asthma yeah so basically some people can be called as if they're allergic to the sun but that yeah some people are sort of photosensitive so if they're exposed to the sun they develop this rash so uh, the best way would be to try to minimize sun exposure as much as possible dress with uh, long covered clothes loosely covered uh, apply regular sunscreen avoid peak hours and um, it's always a good idea to have it checked by uh, a dermatologist, especially if it's recurring and if it's a widespread area, to see what other changes and medications can be added. So going to the next question, um, I am taking antihistamine. Does it have any future consequences and thus continues allergy lead to asthma? So um, just because you have one type of allergy doesn't mean you will get asthma. But again, it doesn't mean you will not. So we cannot say anything in, in that regard. Now, any medicine 
um, of course, they're all chemically made, so they all have their side effects. Some medicine have proven to have a, a bigger safety profile, so they are safer to take for longer periods without having much effect on the body. But then again, there are many antihistamines, different categories uh, with different side effect profiles and uh, different tolerance for different people. So it depends on the antihistamine being taken. How long have you been taking it? What for? So we always try to balance the benefit against the harm. So, for example, if you are taking it and it's protecting you from something like an, an urticaria or an allergic reaction that's quite severe, then yes, definitely it is worth taking it for a longer period. But if you're taking it for just a, a small episode, then it's always a good idea to check back with your doctor and see how long do you actually need to stay on it. They can always sort of um, put you on a lesser um, strength antihistamines so there are different types for targeting different issues different antihistamines so there are ones for viral infections there are ones for rashes for allergies for runny nose so it's always a good idea to check with your physician and see which one works best for you so what is the role of vitamin d in asthma or allergy yeah so vitamin d has been studied and Again, nothing conclusive, but because vitamin D helps with a lot of other stuff, so it is thought to help with asthma as well. So they have been studies that linked, for example, those with lesser vitamin D to having more severe asthma, but we can't say that this causes that. But vitamin D is important for a lot of other areas in the body, so it's always a good idea to keep your vitamin D levels within normal range. So, Doc, we have completed all all the questions thank you so much for your time it was a real informative session hope, hope our audience um, enjoyed the session thank you so much have a thank nice you. day thank you for having me all the best <laughs>